Welcome back to the Trade Hacker Mindset. In this episode, we've got a special guest with us today, one of our community members, Dick K. Trading the markets can be difficult to master and seemingly just out of reach. Professional traders have a secret. Trading requires total mental and emotional control. It requires the Trade Hacker Mindset. All right, welcome back. So we are with one of our community members, Dick K. I've been really looking forward to this conversation, Dick. You and I have interacted quite a bit with just messaging and, and in our community, but I've actually never had a chance to talk to you directly. So welcome. I'm excited to uh, to hear more. Well, thanks, Steve. It's uh, good to be here with you and, and, and catch up. So one thing I actually was wondering is that I that I never asked you how did you how did you originally come across navigation trading how did you find us? I believe I found you through Option Omega. Okay. Um, I think maybe one of the times you did a presentation, I joined and I was really interested in some of your longer term strategies, hedgehog, iron ducks, things like that. They were relatively new to me, although I've been trading for quite a long time and really had an interest to learn more about those strategies and honestly stayed for the community and, and because of you, Steve. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Appreciate that. So, so you said you've been trading a long time. How long is a long time? How long have, how long have you been trading? So maybe I'll separate a little bit between investing and trading. Uh, I guess I started buying stocks with the Motley Fool back in 91. Uh, when I was still obviously working full time, uh, you know, they'd put out recommendations. I'd put in my order uh, after hours, and uh, or in the morning, and you know, hope it was filled in the evening. I did that through, say, '93, '94. That's when I started getting into options. Um, at that time, I guess I was writing covered calls, if I remember correctly. 94 was a relatively flat year. So the, uh, the idea of writing covered calls really appealed to me. Uh, so started writing covered calls, 94, uh, probably 96, 97, I got into buying leaps and maybe doing some shorter term strategies, mostly you know, based on the Motley Fool's recommendations at that time. And, your, and your, your covered calls that you started with, was that because you already had long stock positions and you were just trying to collect that premium on them or were you initiating them as new strategies, as new trades altogether? It was a little bit of both, uh, Steve. Some of it, um, some of the strategies were just basically income producing strategies. So I would buy the stock with the idea of writing covered calls and some I was just covering positions that, that I currently had in my investment portfolio. So you got bit by the option bug, started, started buying some longer term leaves. You said, forget about this stock. I can just, I can just buy the options. And that would, what was kind of the next phase? You know, I guess that kind of went status quo until I left Bank of America in, in um, 16, um, with maybe some hiccups in the, in, in the middle of the road, so to speak. Um, I became a little bit more active, but the challenge with that was that I would um, become busy with work and totally lose perspective of my portfolio and the positions I had on. So um, it ramped up a little bit, say prior to 16, but then there was a time a couple years before that where I just, I needed to cut it way back because I was making mistakes just because I wasn't focused on trading, I was focused on my career. And then you retired in 17, is that correct? 16, Okay. 2016, um, did a little bit of consulting. I worked for one of these startups I was involved in or had invested in, and I did that through 2017 when I really started to become more active and I, and I could focus on trading um, with a much greater intensity, I guess. And so when you started to become more active, when things started slowing down in your, in your career life, what, what were kind of the strategies that you started with? I was still doing swing trades, um, basically based on technical analysis, on a daily or a weekly chart. Wasn't doing anything really short term at all. 
So maybe, you know, writing an option eight weeks out, three months out, maybe selling some calls against it, you know, if the market got soft. Um, but that's really kind of how I got into trading on a regular basis. And so at that point, were you still buying options or were you selling puts for swing trades or what, what kind of? No, I, I was still, I was, I've been an option buyer primarily until end of 21, early 22. Okay. And so it was all directional, all directional all selling, trades. selling calls against it to even out some of the bumps in the road. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then when did you transition to more of a Delta neutral premium selling type strategy? Yeah. So 22 and of 21 and 22 was tough for swing trading. At least it was for me. Um, and although I had been profitable, you know, looking back at the end of the year, you know, I had some really rough quarters and I didn't feel real good about that. So it was the end of 21 into 22 when I got into more double calendars, iron condors strategies that are in that vein. And, and how did you, how did you initially go about learning those? Were you watching tasty trade or just YouTube videos? Did you follow somebody specific? What, what was your kind of your path to learning those? So read a lot of books, watched a lot of videos, um, was the primary reason I I'd always been into back testing, whether it was CML or, um, wall street. I liked the idea of increasing my probability of success by what has happened in the past. So um, I always had liked that Old aspect field. of trading, but with Option Omega and the ability to you know, focus on strategies that I couldn't backtest anywhere else, that, that really got me going in, in that direction. Iron condors, calendars, and the like. Gotcha. Okay. And so, so today, what would you, what would you say is your, your absolute favorite strategy if you had to pick one? Wow. Um, so I don't like to have one strategy because I think that reduces my probability of success on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. So I would say, um, double calendars, number one, probably, and then, uh, zero or one day condors. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I would ask, I would answer the question the same way, right? I mean, that's that's like asking you, Dick, what, which one of your children do you love the most, right? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and, you know, and to that point too, I mean, I think it's I think it's important, you know. I mean, there there are certainly some people who focus on one symbol, one strategy, and you can be very successful doing that. That's definitely not ever been my cup of tea. I mean, I really like the idea of diversifying, layering in with different strategies at different price levels, at different volatility levels and things like that. So it sounds like you're, you're kind of on the same page. Yeah. I mean, clearly, you know, there's uncertainty in the market. And if, if your whole game is based on, you know, the one pony show, I think that's tough. I think it's going to be tough to keep your mind right and harder to keep your risk under control. So yeah, being diversified is for me, how I really like to trade. And so was there, was there a, I don't know, call it a turning point. Was there a, was there an aha moment? Was there one moment in time where you really kind of turned the corner in your trading and, and you were like, okay, now I, I, I got this, this, this is something that, yeah, my, my career's over. I'm a full-time trader, but you weren't really sure that you could do it full-time, but was, was there one point where you were like, okay, I got this. So I, I think in 20, mid 20 to early 21, I really started to focus on the process. I think I had read um, Mark Douglas's book three or four times by then. And it just really kind of started, started to click for me. Um, I remember uh, back in that time when I would ask my wife, don't ask me how I did today. Ask me if I followed my trade plan because that's smart really became what was important because I knew if I could execute on my trade plan, I would be successful, consistently successful. 
And um, if I had to put you know, my finger on one time and one element, it was really when I started to focus on following my plan, calming my emotions, um, you know, everything Douglas talks about in his book. Yeah, that's cool. It, it, it's amazing that uh, that that moment for be, nearly ever every trader I've ever spoken to is when they start focusing on themselves as opposed to the indicator, the strategy, the who they follow, you know, those kind of things. And so it's it's pretty amazing that that just continues to be the answer. Right. Right. Yeah, I um I I completely agree. I I am not um of the mindset that you can only have control of your emotions. I believe, you know, you have to have some understanding of the market, what's making it move um to some degree. Uh with that being said, I don't have a TV in my office. I don't watch the news. Maybe on Fed days I'll, you know, throw on CNBC, but you know, I don't care about the news or, what, or what's really going on more just what's happening bar by bar in the market. And so when you're, when you're evaluating, when you're in trades and you're evaluating them, I've, I've heard you make a couple of comments about, you know, different tools you use, whether it's technical analysis type tools or internals or things like that. So when you, when you're trading, wh where do you draw the line between trading your plan based on a back test and being a little bit more discretionary with the tools that you're looking at? Right. So in a time like we're going through with zero TE trades, they're not as profitable because of the lower volatility. They can still be profitable, uh, especially at certain times of the day. But I put more weight on my experience, on the internals, what I'm seeing happen happening in the market when um, Maybe a maybe a back test is is transitioning. You know, I think you know my morning zero DTEs. I've really stopped doing those. Something with a much later entry in the morning um, and and smaller size because it hasn't been back testing as well the last sixty days. So a lot more discretion on that trade compared to you know, the five calendars I'll open up today on Friday, my big day for calendars, um, when I'll follow my plan, you know, to the letter. So and how uh, and how many how many different positions do you have on at any given time? So in my just speaking of products that I back test, um, I think I have twenty one or twenty two in my portfolio that, that I in option omega. Um, so if the criteria of the back test is met, call it 21 in a week. And then I still have a lot of stocks that I still invest in that I like. I like Google. I like, I like a lot of the big tech names and have, and when the market gets soft, um, obviously I'll, I'll cover them. So I don't know how many that would be if I included my investments as well as my, my trades. Trades, I would say active. Your active trades, you may have as many as 20 or 21, but yeah. you have other long, more long-term, what yeah. you would consider long-term investments outside that. Correct. Gotcha. And I might, you know, I might, there's some setups that I like. Um, I trade the futures, I trade any commodity. So, you know, if I find a setup that I really, really like, um, or I happen to see it um, from a discretionary, I'll take the trade. Gotcha. So maybe throw in a couple more of those a week. So I, you shared with me one time, not too long ago, you shared with me kind of your, your spreadsheet. Right. I got to say, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. I mean, it is very detailed. I mean, you have it down to the, here's the strategy, here's the margin required, here's, here's kind of the back-tested profit. I mean, it, it's a pretty dynamic sheet. Tell us, uh, right. tell us a little bit more. I know it's without seeing it, it, it may be difficult, but tell us kind of how you process all these different strategies that you're trading on a daily basis. All right. So I, I enjoy technology and I use a lot of technology in my trading. So, um, I update all of my back tests every night. Um, well, I say I don't. I have a, a program that updates all my back tests. Um, then it runs my portfolio 
and I export it into Excel where I can look at you know, how every strategy performed that closed yesterday. I double check to make sure I opened up the correct strategies, um, but it will tell me you know, on, on any one of the strategies in Excel, so I don't have to go back and forth. I can uh, view how each strategy has performed over the last week, the last month, the last three months. Um, I know what my projected margin requirements are going to be for the next day, and that's really more for planning because you're doing a lot of calendars, you don't want them overlapping, so I have a number of accounts that, that I trade out of. So uh, did I hear you correct? You, you have technology, kind of an automated system that pulls the back tests from Option Omega into your spreadsheet and updates your portfolio, your back tests every day? Correct. It, it's, it's not like an API or anything. I just run some macros that will go into Option Omega, update my strategies, uh, and then update the portfolio and download it. So if you're downloading the portfolio, you know, I think there's maybe 5,000, 6,000 lines um, or records in Excel that you know, I can slice through very quickly um, without having to go back and forth between uh, Option Omega and a number of times during the day. And so then you start your day, you've got your sheet, you've got all your updates, you've got your position size based on margin required, all that good stuff. Then you have it kind of designed from a perspective of, okay, today vol is contracting or just today's Wednesday or whatever it is. And so then you have your list of trades of like, okay, today's Wednesday, here's what I'm going to do. Is that kind of the high level? That, that's exactly it. I, I look at the trades I'm going to be opening up today. I looked how they performed the last week, month, 60 days. I, I can't say I do that because I have a good feeling of how the trades have performed. Um, but yeah, then I put together the lists of trades I anticipate opening um, during the day. Um, I check the trades that closed the previous day and make sure that the back test res or my results are close to in line with the back test results. And if they're not, you know, I want to figure out why, what did I do wrong? What could I have done better? Um, but yeah, all that is part of my, my morning morning routine. Gotcha. Cool. Very cool. And so of your of your process, just of your process of trading in general, is what what's one thing that you find most difficult to follow? You know, I mean, is it position sizing? Is it you know, actually pulling the trigger on taking a trade because you're not sure like what 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 would be one thing that's that's difficult for you to just absolutely follow from your process you know I, I feel like I've made a lot of mistakes during my trading career especially early on honestly I don't I don't struggle with pulling the trigger on the trade um, position sizing I know what that's gonna be you know before the day starts so that's that's not a question when I when I exercise the trade um, my risk management, I feel, is very much in check. Um, I mean, probably what I would say I struggle with most is that some of my back tests have rather large um, stop losses, 200% 200, 200 in some cases. You know, the, the return is amazing over, over six months, but you, you might take some big hits on a daily basis. And... So second guessing the back test when you know you're getting close to hitting that stop loss and you know maybe you want to get out at 150% versus the 200% stop loss um, so to not to stick with the trade and see it through follow the back test especially on those trades with the larger stop losses would probably be the biggest challenge so you want winded answer. You have, a, you have a tendency to want to pull the trigger, bail yep. quicker than than what the yep. test is showing. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it, it was interesting. Probably four or five weeks ago, um, I was taking a ton of heat on a on a good size um, iron condor. It was within my risk profile, but I was taking a ton of heat, and I pulled the trigger. I I got out at I don't know, call it a hundred and thirty percent loss, and, and um, you know, I looked at it the next morning and 
it went back to, to full profit. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you still make mistakes like that. And, um, you know, that struggle to stick with the plan, especially with the large stop losses, is what's hard. Right. Yeah. So kind of dovetailing on this topic of making mistakes, because I, I really think that people learn the most from their mistakes or hopefully from other people's mistakes. Uh, right. that's, that's a tough one for me. I usually have to hit myself across the head with a mistake before it, before it gets to me. But, and this could be, you know, in the last year, six months, two year, five years, whatever. What's the, what's the biggest trading mistake that you've met? What, what, what's the biggest trading blunder that you've gone through that always kind of sticks out in your mind? Like I'm never going to let that happen again. Yeah. So when I was still working, um, full time, it was 2015. I sold some calls on the VIX and the VIX went up like Ooh. two months in a row. It was relatively high. Um, and I thought this is, this is a no brainer. Um, so I sold the calls and then work just exploded. Um, my risk management really back in 15 was non-existent. Um, so, so work exploded and the VIX exploded at the same yeah. time? <laughs> same time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, that was a, a six-digit loss by the time I kind of focused on, oh, my God, you know, I looked at it, you know, weeks had gone by. Uh, maybe it was a 60-day, you know, 60-day sell, um, and I took just a huge bath. Gotcha. Um, so did, when that happened, did you – stop trading for a while altogether or what what, what was your no, mental state I, I mean, at that I, point I, I didn't stop trading i mean i had none of the disciplines that i do today um so i really just um scaled my size made sure i had you know a process even if it was like okay dick you got to check every day you know, you got to take 10 minutes at least to check your position because I didn't get that hole that deep in the hole overnight. You know, it was a number of weeks that uh, the VIX continued to go up and I was still short. Gotcha. So, you know, in, in 15, it was just, you know, all right, you got to take 10 minutes every day and review your positions because I wasn't trading full time. Gotcha. Um, yeah, those are those are painful, expensive lessons. For sure. But, you know, it it. it it probably still affects me to today in that I check my positions at the end of the day, make sure my closing orders are in place where I want to close it. And I do the same thing in the morning again. So, um, you know, I have that kind of redundancy now built in and probably to a great extent, you know, that loss in 2015 is still resonating uh, with me to some degree, someplace deep in my mind. Well, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure your accounts are much bigger now. So if something like that happened today, the loss would be maybe seven figures <laughs> instead of six. So while yeah. it was expensive back then, it probably helped save you some money in yeah. the long term, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, cool. So, so you've talked a little bit about your processes from a trading standpoint. What, what, about, what about your routine or things that you do that are kind of not trading related, like from a just a mindfulness, or I've heard you say that you, you regularly meditate on a daily basis. Yep. Tell us a little bit about your routine, pre-market, maybe even during the trading day when you're in trades, things you need to do, or post-market, or whatever your routine is around those things. Sure. Um, I am a very early riser. I'm usually up between 4 and 4.30. No alarm. That's just when I get up. Um, I meditate um, during that time. Um, it might be sitting outside in a sweater and, you know, looking at the lake, the moon's still shining on it, but just being awake, but calming my mind. And I really think that is important as it unfolds throughout your day, because you have a greater sense of calmness and, um, awareness, uh, to be able to interact with your family better, trade better, um, make better decisions. Um, so 
that's that's part of my morning. And then usually before the market um, opens, five minutes or so before the market opens, I take some time just to do some deep breaths, um, you know, to take a break from thinking about the market uh, before the market opens. Part of my routine, um, you know, is to review the markets. I'm, I'm heavily focused on what happened yesterday, evaluating uh, what I did well, what I could have done better. Um, but then I like to take that couple minutes before the, the bell rings to kind of clear my head. Well, what would you say to listeners who maybe have never done any kind of meditating or breath work or anything like that? We, we As you know, we recently started a mindfulness cha uh, channel in our community, and it's, it's led by uh, Bianca, one of our community members, because that's, that's really a big focus in her life. Uh, it's certainly not an uh, area of expertise for me. And, you know, I know when I first kind of started meditating on a consistent basis or doing some of these things, it was very uncomfortable. It was very weird. What, f for listeners who are not, have not done any of that, what, what would you, what kind of advice would you tell them to, as far as getting started or how did you get started? Right. So I believe I got started with an app. Um, and I would say that it's like the first time you work out. It's, it's hard. You feel like you're not doing it well. Um, you don't have the control of your mind that maybe you feel that you should. And because of that, you think right away, oh, it's, it's not going to work for me. But, and I think I've, I've said this before, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like your brain is a muscle. You have to make it stronger by practicing something again and again. And, you know, maybe it was three months, maybe it was four, I don't remember exactly, but you just hit this point where if you don't do it, you really miss it. So I would say you can't give up early. It takes time, just like it takes time to develop any muscle. Um, and although you can read a lot of books about it, you can watch videos, you can hear other people talk about it, until you really get into the practice, I'm speaking for myself, I didn't really understand the benefits that it would bring to my life. And not just trading. Uh, you know, I think I'm more present with my wife and my kids. I sleep better. Um, so yeah, that's, it, it just takes a little time to get into the practice. Um, and don't give up early because you, feel, you don't feel you're good at it. Very good. Um, so... When you're going back to your kind of your daily routine, your trading, w tell us a little bit about that. I mean, are you locked in from bell to bell? Are you putting on trades and you're going about things? Tell, tell us how trading fits into your lifestyle and what that looks like on a daily basis. Right. Well, as I said, I get up early. Um, but then when my wife and the kids get up, I take a break for an hour and a half or so, you know, have breakfast with the kids and, and my wife, Kim. Uh, and how old are your kids? I have a uh, nine-year-old and a 12-year-old. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, every morning, you know, I have time with my wife, my kids. I take the kids to school. Um, and then I'm back in time um, half an hour or so before the market's open, tie up any loose ends, and then take that, you know, five minutes before the bell um, to refocus myself and, and prepare for the day. As far as my routines during the day, um, you know, the first hour really seems to be when I have the most going on. Um, I'm taking a break at some point in the day, um, just getting away from the screens, whether I'm going for a walk with my wife or we're going out to lunch or I'm getting in a workout. Um, every day, I, I need to take some time away, away from the screens. And, you know, I might have other things. I have other things in my life besides trading. So, what? Yeah. Other things besides trading? I don't. I don't understand that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, you know, so I'd say between nine and four, you know, I'm in front of the screens eighty percent of the time, but not not close to a hundred percent of the time. Gotcha. On most days. On most days. Gotcha. So some some point in the midday, you're you're out getting some fresh air, getting away um, from the screens. Exactly, exactly. Right. And, and uh, no need to disclose location by any means because I don't want my fellow trade hackers 
looking you up and finding you, Dick. <laughs> but uh, I, I understand you have a kind of a place that you go during the summer and you have a different home during the other other months of the year, right? Right. We, we um, just moved to Florida from um, the, up north on the East Coast. Okay. Um, so we live close to the beach, so enjoying um, you know, the beach life, so to speak, uh, during the colder months. And um, in the summer, we uh, head to Michigan um, and, and spend our summers uh, on a lake in Michigan. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh. That's great. So when you're when you're doing things outside of trading, what uh, what are some of your favorite things to do outside of trading? You know, most of what I like to do outside of trading is is my wife and kids. I spend a lot of time with the kids, whether it be sports or you know, just traveling, doing something with the kids. We do like to travel, um, play a little tennis, a little pickleball, but a lot of my life revolves around my family, which is which is just how I want it. Yeah. That's amazing. That, that's amazing. That sounds like a, sounds like a great life, my friend. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. we can go ahead and wrap things up here, but what, if there's anything else, is there anything else that you want to listeners to know about you or any advice you have for them from a trading perspective or just life perspective? I truly believe that the mental aspect of trading is the most important. If you don't have control of your emotions, of how you feel about money, of how you feel about losing, I think it's going to be really hard to be successful as a trader. So those are things I think you have to work on as much as any other part of trading. You have so you to understand yourself. So you mentioned a couple of things that you started with. You mentioned Mark Douglas trading in the zone. You mentioned from a meditation standpoint, you kind of started with an app. Was that the Calm app um, or Headspace? Headspace. It was Headspace. Okay. Yeah, Headspace. that's a good one too. Exactly. And so th those are a couple of resources. What, what other, any other books or any other resources that you'd suggest for new people trying to focus in on that aspect? You know, I just love to learn. So I think any item that helps you learn about yourself is a value. I, I don't know if I could put together a list of 10 things because I feel like I ingest everything that comes my way about that. Um, but you know, Trading in the Zone by Douglas, Mark Douglas is, you know, if you can read that book and understand it and internalize it, that would probably do the trick for most. Yeah. I, f I know I find myself reading it at least once a year. Yep, exactly. And I, and every, and you know, I, I mean, I've probably read it, I don't know, 10, 12 times and I still pick up something new every single time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I did my first 12 episodes of this podcast were breaking down yep. different concepts of that book. And I still get into something new every time I read it. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And in, in fact, I'm, I'm going through your earlier uh, episodes and like, like you, although I've read the book numerous times, I'm picking something up from uh, listening to the uh, early early podcast that, that you put together. So thank that's you awesome. for that. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's what, it, that's what I did it for. Um, well, cool, Dick. Well, if, if nothing else from you, we'll, we'll wrap this up. I really appreciate your time, uh, just your insight, your experience, um, just how active you are in our community. I mean, you've got kind of a, a, a very um, giving, way about you in the community i mean you've helped other people i mean you with your experience i know you 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 probably get uh messages and questions maybe more than you prefer but we always appreciate your your uh activity in the in the community and, and what, you, what you've done to just kind of help everybody out from your perspective no i um i i think that's part of it is giving back and um i enjoy the community there's there's some great people and happy to help anybody in, in any way that i can that's great. Well, Dick, great time, great conversation. Look forward to continuing to see you in the community. And uh, thank you for everything. Thank you, Steve. Enjoyed it. All right. Take care.